we are talking about finding purpose, and uh, we know that we enjoy finding something we've lost, right? Or finding something that we've never had. When you find your true love, right? And uh, when you find uh, your car keys after being lost, uh, is, is a time to rejoice. And finding purpose in life is, is very similar to that. I think so many of us lack direction. They lack a destination. And I think oftentimes the reason why we lack a direction is because we lack the destination. We don't know where we're going. We don't know how we're going to get there. We don't even know where that is out there somewhere, but we are looking for it. And that's tough. And that's tough to look for something you don't know what you're trying to find. And so we're talking about finding purpose. We've covered several different topics. We've talked about finding purpose in, in work. Uh, we, talk, we, we started off by, by just talking about the purpose of purpose. We talked about the purpose of passion and the purpose of perspective. Uh, three different messages geared for a, a, a same audience, but for different purposes. And this morning, we're going to dive back into our series uh, on finding purpose and talk about the purpose of leadership. Now, I mentioned to you last time we were together that there are essentially three different institutions that the Lord had ordained, three different institutions. Number one being civil government. We talked about that last time we were together. The second institution is the family or the home. And the third, the third is the church. So when we talk about the purpose and leadership, we need to figure out what this thing looks like with regards to the home and with regards to the church. Now, this is very, very basic. It's very basic, and I don't want to uh, confuse anybody. I don't want to, um, to belabor any points, but there are some certain things within the home and within the church that we need to discuss. Now, outside of the government, the church, or the government, the home, and the church. With, outside of that, there are other types of leadership. Uh, if you are an employer, you have a type of leadership. And this is not what we're talking about. Now, it's, it's very important we understand that type of leadership. And there are qualities within those leaders, managers, bosses, etc., etc. But we're not going to talk about those in this setting. We're only talking about these three things. Uh, this morning, primarily, the home and the church. So let's talk about these things. First of all, leadership in the home. Now, within the leadership of the home, there, are, uh, there is a relationship between the parents and the children. Okay? Now, use the parents up here and the children down here because, according to Scripture, that is where they're at. Now, I'm telling you from a, a pastor's heart, from a parent's heart, from, a, from a, a husband's heart, from just my heart, I'm telling you that there is some real, honest-to-goodness rebellion going on in this world with the kids today. And I, 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 am, I am just appalled at how kids treat their parents. And it's, it's frightening, just honestly, it's frightening to me to see how the kids treat their parents. It's scary. It's not how it should be. It's not how it should be. Listen to this verse. Ephesians chapter 6 really gives a, uh, a really profound and a really concise relational uh, developing and experiencing of, or between, between a, a parent and the, and the children. Listen to this. Children, it says, To obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, the purpose, the purpose of children is not to mow your grass. <laughs> now, my kids mowed my grass the other day, and that was wonderful, and uh, I enjoyed that. Matter of fact, I, I helped uh, them mow and, and uh, clean up the yard a little bit and, and do some things. But the purpose of having kids, the purpose of children itself, is not that they do something for you in the sense of mowing your grass. But there is a, a, a base purpose, an underlying purpose, a fundamental, foundational purpose, and that is the purpose of obeying their parents, obeying and honoring. Two different things, by the way, and we'll discuss them briefly. Obey your parents in the Lord. Obey your parents in the Lord, verse 1. For this is right. The primary responsibility of children is to obey what it is their parents tell them. That's 
That's number one. Secondly, we get to chapter, verse two, honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Now this goes on to say that it may be well with thee and that thou mayest live long upon the earth. Now this is the promise of children. Now listen, honoring your parents, honoring your mother and your father is the first commandment with promise. That means that there was a command and a promise if you obey that command. You know what that command was? To obey your parents, or honor your parents rather. And if you honor your parents, that you may live long upon the earth. That's a nice promise. Does it mean that you'll live to be 90 or 100? Well, no, it doesn't necessarily mean that. It means that you'll live longer if you honor your mother and father than if you don't. This is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee that thou mayest live long upon the earth. Now, we get to the second portion of this, and the second portion is to the parents or the father. Now, the first one is the children are supposed to obey their parents. Now, what are the parents supposed to do? What's the father supposed to do? Well, it gets here. And fathers, and ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Your responsibility, your responsibility, this is your purpose, because we're talking about purpose. Your purpose, children, is to, is to honor, to obey and to honor your parents. The purpose of the parents is to bring their children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Don't provoke them, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And if you do that, you see, this is really neat. If a parent, if a parent brings their children, if they don't provoke them and they bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, the chances of them, listen to this, obeying their parents and the Lord for this is right, and honoring thy father and the mother, for this is the first commandment with promise, the chances are much greater. So when I look out amongst our generation, when I look amongst the people of our community, amongst the, the people of society, the world, our state, the, whatever, the United States, when I look out and I see all these people and I say, this is a rebellious group, I have to ask myself this question, why? Why? And here is why, let me tell you, because the parents, generally speaking, have not brought their children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And in fact, they provoked them. So not only did they not bring them up the way they were supposed to be, they brought them up the way they shouldn't have. It's a double-edged sword. So when I see a rebellious child, I have to ask myself the question, is the parent rebellious? Because If a parent is rebelling against what God has for them, then the child will rebel against what God has for them. Now listen to this in verse 7 of Deuteronomy chapter 6. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Now what is he talking about? He's talking about the law, the commandments, right? And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. This is important. When we begin to do what it is we need to do as parents, the children, generally speaking, that's a generalization, will begin to do what they need to do. When I see a child out of control, I have to say, is the parent out of control? And this is really important. The output always is determined by the input. What they produce is a result by what we instill. And if we are bringing them up with these godly biblical values, if we bring them up with godly biblical values, we will see a generation that practices godly biblical values and will begin to obey their parents in the Lord and honor their father and mother. If you bring them upright, you have a much better chance of them producing that which is right. Now, let me just say two things. Because we're talking about parents and children and their relationship. First of all, first of all, children have a responsibility, a responsibility to obey their parents. Parents, don't be a jerk to your children. Don't be a jerk to your children. Because, in essence, that's provoking them in verse 4, Ephesians, right? Ephesians, that's a verse we just covered. Provoke not your children. You see, I think oftentimes parents know that children are supposed to be obedient. And because they're supposed to be obedient, they're a jerk because of it. Now listen, 
Parents, don't be a jerk. Now, children, listen, this is to you. This is an admonishment to the children. One is an admonishment to the parents, don't be a jerk, because your kids should be obeying you. The second is an admonishment to the children. Children, obey your parents, even if they are a jerk. Now, that's hard. But it's Bible. Now, it's always easier to obey somebody who's not a jerk. So parents, don't be a jerk instill biblical values and principles into your kids, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and generally speaking, they will be loving their parents. They will be obedient to their parents. They will honor them. So this cuts both ways. So parents, do what you need to do. Children, do what you need to do, regardless if your parents do what they need to do. It's very, very, very important. Now, that's the first relationship within within the family, within the home. Now, there's another relationship in the home. We all know what that is. One is the parents and the children. The other is between the parents, husbands and the wives, between them. This is their relationship. And when we get to Ephesians chapter 5, this is a tender subject, so listen carefully. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 and 20, through 25. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now listen, the purpose of the wife is to submit to their own husband. Okay, Not to other people's husbands. right? To your own husband, as unto the Lord. What does that mean? That means wives submit to your husbands as if they were the Lord. Now that sounds heavy, but that's just Bible. I'm not making it up. It's here in your Bible. It's here on the screens. You see it. The wives are supposed to submit on that level. They're supposed to submit themselves. Now the purpose of the husbands is to love their wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. You see, so this cuts both ways. This isn't just a strong admonishment for women to just submit to their husbands. This is an admonishment to men to love their wives when they do not submit to them. Because just like parents and children, when children are out of control and they won't submit to their parent because they're a jerk, you know what? Here's what the Bible says. Husbands, love your wives even if they're being a jerk. And wives, love your husbands even if they're a jerk. And all of this is based on the perspective that if you have a right relationship with God, this, won't, this will be a non-issue. Because it's really easy to submit yourself to someone who's willing to love you and die for you. And it's really easy to love someone if they'll do anything you ask them to do. Husbands are to love their wives, and wives are to submit themselves to their husbands. Now, you don't see a lot of this in today's society. You don't see a lot of it. You see a lot of bantering and, 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 and husbands and wives and fighting and the nitpicking and the nagging and all of these things, and it's really sad. You have husbands who won't lay down their lives for their wives. You know, it's interesting when you read this passage when it says, husbands love your wives even as Christ loved the church. Do you know that was his primary purpose? And coming to this world was to die for us and create to himself a church. Not an assembly like this, not the building. But a body of believers. He knew his primary purpose was not to come to be ministered unto, but to minister. And to give his life a ransom for many. He gave his life. And when we talk about our wives, listen, they're not going to do what they should do. Because they're not perfect. And you know what? You're not going to love your wife like you should because you're not perfect. And so our goal here is reciprocal, but it is also independent. It's independent in the sense that if they negate their responsibility, you still have to come through with yours. You have a job to do. You have been called to love your wives regardless if they don't love you. You have been called to love your wives even if they hate you. As a matter of fact, Jesus came to this earth knowing that many would forsake and hate him. And he came anyway, didn't he? He came anyway knowing 
what the result was going to be. And we need, we need to love our wives, but the wives, we need to submit. You all, not we, not we as me, you need to submit yourselves to your husbands. And you know what? They're going to be a jerk. They're not going to be perfect. They're going to treat you wrong sometimes, a lot of times. Because they are made of the dirt of the ground just like you are. And so the wives need to submit and husbands need to love. And I tell you what, when wives submit and husbands love, irrespective of, of, of their responsibility, if, if my wife does not submit herself, my goal is to still love her. And my goal is to, is to train up my children in the way they should go. And when they're older, they should not depart from it, right? Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And I should do that regardless if my children obey me, regardless if my children honor us, and regardless if my wife submits to me. I still have a responsibility. Now, oh, how great the world would be if the kids came through with their responsibility, wives came through with their responsibility, husbands came through with their responsibility. If we all did what we have to do, what we should do, what we're called to do, this would be a great We'd have great lives. There's a responsibility here on everyone's part, but our purpose, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at our purpose, right? If you husbands are saying, what's my purpose to my wife? What's my purpose for my wife? My purpose is to love her unconditionally. That means without condition. Just like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And wives, if you're looking for a purpose, your purpose for your husband is to submit yourselves to him as unto the Lord. And children, if you're looking for a purpose, your purpose is not only to, to obey your parents in the Lord, but it's also to honor your father and mother. Two different things, by the way. Parents, if you want to have a purpose for your children, your, parent, your, your, your purpose is simple. Instill biblical values, still biblical values, biblical principles, to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You know, that's my purpose. My purpose is not to take them fishing. Now, I take them fishing. I've been fishing twice now in the last couple weeks. That was more than we did all last year. Isn't that right? Now, that's not my purpose in life. My purpose in life is to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Don't provoke them but bring them up the way they ought to be brought up. That's our purpose in the home. Now, let's look at the leadership in the church. So one was leadership in the, in the home, leadership in the church. Last time we were together, we looked at leadership in the government. Okay, leadership in the church. Uh, this is speaking to me, by the way. And this is, this is I, I, when I say that I've preached this to myself the last two weeks, I prepared this message two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, almost two and a half weeks ago. And I preached this to me several times, and so, when I say that, I don't mean that lightly. I mean, I am speaking to me. As a matter of fact, I want someone to come up here and preach this to me. No, I'm kidding. This is a real significant uh, outfit. Now, it's significant to me as a, as, as, a, as a husband and as a father, as leadership in the home. That's true. But this, as I'm preaching to you, just remember I'm preaching to me. First of all, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. First of all, let me say this. As I talk about this passage in relation to me, I'm not perfect. And you all know that. I am flawed just like every one of you are. And, and many of you have been here several years, and if, 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 you, if you're still here in 20 years, and uh, well, some of you, if you're here in 20 years, it's pretty amazing. But <laughs> he says, thank you. <laughs> Only if you're 70 or 85. But anyway, if you're still here, you'll realize that I'm going to make mistakes. Matter of fact, I, I make a lot of them. Make a lot of mistakes. I make a lot of wrong turns. So nobody is perfect, no matter where you go to church, no matter what pastor you sit under. You maybe just not, don't know him as well. But I tell you what, that pastor is just as flawed as someone you know very, very well. We all have our flaws. So, uh, the purpose, the pastor's purpose in this passage is to feed and to lead. To feed and to lead. Feed the flock 
which is among you. That's you. Now, there's a lot of churches, a lot of pastors, and I'm not, I'm not coming down hard on them, but here's what I'm saying. There's a lot of pastors, a lot of preachers, a lot of teachers that are so, uh, that it's so important to them that they feed the world. That's not what this passage says. When we're talking feeding, we're talking spiritual food here. That's what this is talking about. I'm not trying to make things confusing to you. When it's talking about feeding, I feed you. I'd say this, ta- this pulpit is the table whereby I feed the flock of God. This is where I'm giving to you the spiritual nutrients, the spiritual nutrition you need to grow. My goal, my goal is to feed the flock which is among me, not in another county. Listen, the, the books that, that this team puts together based on my sermons are great, and we put them on Amazon, and we, we try to sell them. <laughs> we try to sell them. We give a lot of them away. But that's to feed the flock that is not among me. This passage right here, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight. My goal is to feed, to help instill in you biblical values. Now, it's interesting how it parallels the relationship between parents and children. Because as a parent, you you feed your children spiritual nourishment. We look back in Deuteronomy, right? Teach them diligently as thou sittest in thy house, so that walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up, right? That's the goal. Feeding your children spiritual food. My goal as a pastor is to give you the nutrition you need to fight the good fight, to run the race. I never want to be distracted from that. I don't mind radio ministries and television ministries and book ministries and and, and I, I, I believe this is an evangelistic church. We're even trying harder to make it more evangelistic, more outreach-based. But my goal is to feed you guys. And as you get fed, then you take the food that you have and you share it with others, spiritually speaking. Spiritually speaking. So it's to feed and to lead. The second thing is to take the oversight. That's to lead. This is not dealing with just the feeding It's dealing with giving the direction that comes along with the feeding. I heard it put best this last week, that the congregation, that the church should lean into the direction of the pastor. They should lean in that direction. So when I'm trying to guide you and trying to steer the church and the ministry, you folks, not only am I feeding, but I'm leading you. I'm trying to show you where the green grass is, where the still waters are. I'm trying to get us to the place where there's shade. I want you to be protected. I don't want you to fall over here. I don't want, there's too big of a hill. I'm trying to get us to move, to lean into the direction of the pastor. I'm trying to guide us. That is my responsibility. Not only to feed, but to lead, to take the oversight. Now, oftentimes, you look at a pastor and you say, well, that pastor is so crazy, he's off the rocker. Well, if he's, if he's missed orthodoxy, if he's gone, I mean, if he's off the radar and you don't know what he's doing, well, that comes to this next point, and that's your purpose. Because there is a parishioner's purpose here, too. Not only is there the pastor's purpose, but there's also a parishioner's purpose. My purpose and your purpose. Just like there's the children and the parents, the wives and the husbands, there's the pastor and his flock. Here's the parishioner's purpose. While the pastor's purpose is to feed and the lead, the parishioner's purpose is to follow and to favor. To follow and to favor. First of all, to follow the pastor as he leads. To follow the leader. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11, 1 says, Be ye followers of me, even as I am also of Christ. So you're supposed to follow the leader. That's what the followers are supposed to do. They're supposed to follow along. Now, I don't think I lead in austerity. I don't think I'm a jerk or a tyrant. But I know that my responsibility is to feed in the lead, and yours is to follow as I lead. And this is important. Now, don't, I've never, never once condoned blindly following a pastor. Again, if he's, if he's missed the mark, if he's off, it's time to find a new, a new leader. But as the leader is following Christ, you want to be following him. You want to be following him. 
So not only is the parishioner's purpose to follow the leader, but it's to favor the feeder. You're supposed to favor the pastor, favor the one who is giving you what you need to live. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says this, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you, to know me which labor among you, and are, not, and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Favor the one that's over you in the Lord and that admonishes you. The word admonish means to warn or to reprove gently. Now, isn't that interesting? That, the, that your purpose is to follow me as I lead you and as I admonish you in the Lord. As I, gent, as I warn you, I'm warning you, and as I gently reprove you. It says here that we're supposed to esteem me highly and very highly in love. Now, I'm not trying to stroke my own ego. Believe me, I talk a whole lot more about you than I do about me, and I love you, I, I'm, I'm assuming, as much or more than you love me, and I'm telling you that. My kids and I, we have this thing. We go to, they go to bed at night, and I, I crawl into bed with them, and I kiss them on their cheek and hug them real tight, and I all over their neck, and I say, I love you. And they say, I love you more. I say, I love you way more. They say, I love you way, way more. They say, I love you way, 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 way more. They say, I love you infinity. They say, I love you infinity times 10. I love you infinity times infinity. I love you infinity times infinity. And you just say, I love you way more. And you just have to just take it. And I tell you what, I love you guys. And my whole goal is to feed you and to lead you. I'm not trying to lead you to your execution. Because quite frankly, if I had to lead anybody to the execution, I'll take it for you. Because the goal as the leader and the feeder is I'm going to give you what you need and I'm going to try to lead you beside the still waters just like God tries to lead us all beside the still waters. So the follower is to favor the feeder. The one who at times has to gently reprove and admonish one another. When you go back to Ephesians where it says, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition. That's the rebuke, by the way. The warning, the gently admonishing them. Now, but their responsibility is still to love me and to honor me. And that's your responsibility. As I warn you, it's not like, all right, pastor, he told me something, and I know it was in the Bible. But The whole goal is I'm doing this for your benefit. I'm doing this for your benefit. So there's a lot to take in here, a lot of things to take in as in, with, with, in terms of the home, in terms, in terms of the church. We have so much purpose, though, don't we? So you can never sit in the pew and say, what is my purpose here in church with regards to leadership? Now, we have other purposes within church, and we're going to talk about that later. But your purpose with regards to leadership within the church, and we'll talk about the church, but within leadership. You never have to ask yourself, well, I've got these kids, what's my purpose? Or I've got this spouse, what's my purpose? You can find your purpose, and I, and I hope I was able to show you that these are just basic things that you can do for a purpose-filled life with regards to leadership. And as we talk over the next uh, month and a half, two months on your purpose, we're going to talk about a lot of these vast areas, and, and they're really excellent. You know, I mentioned earlier that Jesus came into this world to die for the sinners. That was his purpose. Do you know what our purpose is? Our purpose is to respond to that. How do we respond to that? He gives us the good news, and that is that Jesus came to this earth to die on the cross for us, and now we have a purpose to respond. That's our purpose. To know eternal life to have an eternal life that we can be with him forever. You see, the gospel is so simple and so many people miss it. And I believe everybody in this room, I, I think everybody is saved, but I got to share this with you, especially after being in a, at a pastor's conference where they were, you know, 
ultimately so evangelistic, I said, I will never not give the gospel. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel, right? I have to share it with you because that's my purpose is to feed and to lead. To show you that you can have an eternal life. I think it was, was it this week that my wife was tutoring one of her students, I think, and, and that was really, really kind of a neat experience. I, I, I encourage evangelism for my, the, the, the teachers and their students. I say, you know what, if they don't want to come and get tutored here, that's fine. But woe unto me is if I preach not the gospel. I said, if we have an opportunity to share something with them that will give them eternal life and we don't, shame on us. So my wife, she's talking to this one student, and they start talking about, she said, well, my, my church has a list of rules. I said, well, I said, well, let's talk about this. What gets a person saved? He said, well, so Danny was able to give this, this young man the gospel. And I don't know if he ever, if he got saved, or but if he understood it or not. But let me just show you this. I want this hand right here to represent you and me, and I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. The Bible says God loves us and hates our sin. The Bible says that there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. We all have this sin. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Not church membership, not water baptism, not a list of rules. But the wages of sin is death, not a list of rules. It's not a bunch of do's and don'ts. The wages of sin is death. Someone has to die. The Bible says that if you die... With this sin, you'll spend an eternity separated from God because you're paying for your sin forever. The Bible also says that Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago, came to die on the cross. To make the payment for sin, he died on the cross. And remember, the wages of sin is death. He died on the cross for you. And the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. It's not a list of rules, friends. It's not a list of rules. And it's so sad to hear people think that. Because we try to make it so clear that the wages of sin is death, not a list of rules. Jesus Christ died on the cross. The Bible says he who knew no sin was made sin for us. He didn't know any sin. He didn't have sin debt to pay for him of himself. Because he didn't have a sin debt to pay for for himself, he was able to pay for ours, the sin of the world, because he's the Son of God. So 2,000 years ago, he died on the cross, was buried, and rose again the third day to prove that his death on the cross was sufficient. See, if he would have died and stayed dead and couldn't bring himself back to life, he wouldn't have been God. He couldn't have paid for the sin of the world. But because he did that, he was able to prove to the world that his payment was sufficient. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. Listen, friends, if you don't know Christ today as your Savior, the Bible says if you place your faith in him, that he died on the cross, was buried, and rose again the third day, you'll have eternal life. That is significant. His purpose was to come to die for us. And now in response, we trust him as our Savior. We believe in him, that he died, was buried, and rose again. And if you've done that, you'll have eternal life. Eternal life, not temporary life. People say, well, what if I, what if I do wrong after I, after, I, after I trust him? It's not about rules. You don't save yourself. He saved you. He's more powerful than you. He keeps you secure forever. We are kept saved by the power of God unto salvation. It's God's power, not ours. When we trust Him, He holds us in His hand like this, and He will never let go. No matter how bad you are, because you're a sinner, and you're going to sin tomorrow, and you're going to sin the next day. Now, I always have to ask people, when Jesus died 2,000 years ago, all of your sins were in the future. The sins you did yesterday, the sins you do today, and the sins you do tomorrow. He paid for all of our sins. It's wonderful. And I just thank God for you.